This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So we have new allegations of a copyright troll and a new lawsuit including DMCA misrepresentations under 17 USC 512F and RICO. Let's take a look at this one. This copyright case concerns an alleged unlawful scheme devised by defendants Ocularity, John Nicolini, Splash News and Picture Agency, Exposure Photo Agency, and Backgrid USA. Defendants are the copyright owners or agents of the copyright owners of the works at issue, photographs of celebrities. Plaintiff Enttech Media LLC accuses defendants of manipulating the takedown notice procedure of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in order to disable monetized social media accounts and then to demand extortionate sums from the social media account holders to have their accounts restored. So it sounds like they would issue takedowns, get your social media account disabled, and then demand extortionate sums from the account holders to get their accounts back. And I don't know whether that's extortion or whether that's illegal. It's going to depend on the facts the parties present in the case. These are the allegations made by the plaintiff. Enttech claims that it was a victim of defendants' conspiracy. According to Enttech, defendants knowingly misrepresented in their takedown notices that they had exclusive rights in the allegedly infringing material and also knowingly misrepresented that they considered the possibility of fair use before issuing the takedown notices in violation of Section 512F of the DMCA. Enttech further alleges that defendant's scheme constitutes a pattern of racketeering activity in violation of the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO. Before the court are three separate but related matters. The first two are defendant's motions for sanctions against Enttech and its counsel, so that's defendant's motions, to dismiss Enttech's third amended complaint, and the court's order to show cause regarding sanctions against Enttech and its counsel. After considering the voluminous papers filed in support, the court grants in part and denies in part defendant's motion to dismiss, denies defendant's motion for sanctions, and discharges the order to show cause. That means plaintiff's case goes forward. So this is Enttech Media Group versus Ocularity, and it continues. The motion to dismiss rule 12b6 tests the legal sufficiency of the claims asserted in a complaint. In a ruling on a 12b6 motion, all allegations of material fact are taken as true and construed in the light most favorable to the opposing, non-moving party. Although a complaint attacked by 12b6 does not need detailed factual allegations, a plaintiff must provide more than labels and conclusions. That's from Bell Atlantic versus Twombly, the landmark 2007 jurisdiction case. To state a plausible claim for relief, the complaint must contain sufficient allegations of underlying facts to support its legal conclusions. Factual allegations must be enough to raise a right to relief above the speculative level on the assumption that all the allegations in the complaint are taken as true. So the non-moving party would be the plaintiff in this motion to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint. So their allegations are taken as true, the factual allegations. A complaint must contain sufficient factual a complaint must contain sufficient factual matter accepted as true to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. Plausibility above mere possibility. There it says mere possibility, and that's Ashcroft v. Iqbal, the 2009 landmark jurisdiction case. Allegations of fraud must be pled with particularity. This means the pleader must detail with particularity the time, place, manner of each act of fraud plus the role of each defendant in the scheme. The heightened pleading standard for fraud applies to claims that are grounded in fraud or sound like fraud. Furthermore, if the court finds that dismissal of the claim is appropriate, it must also decide whether to grant leave to amend However, the court has discretion to deny leave if it determines that the pleading could not possibly be cured by the allegation of other facts. On Enttech's DMCA claim, the DMCA imposes liability for misrepresenting that copyright infringement occurred under Section 512F. To state a claim under 512F, a plaintiff must allege facts to show that 1. Defendant knowingly 
materially misrepresented that copyright infringement occurred. Two, a service provider relied on that misrepresentation. Three, the plaintiff was injured as a result. The knowingly prong of the first element is the focus of the party's arguments. To satisfy the knowingly prong, Entech must allege sufficient facts to show that defendants lacked a subjective good faith belief that the images that were the subject of the takedown notices were infringing. That's from Lentz v. Universal Music, the 2016 Ninth Circuit case. In this regard, the Ninth Circuit has held that the DMCA requires consideration of fair use prior to sending a takedown notification. In other words, a defendant in a 512F claim cannot maintain that it formed a subjective good faith belief of the plaintiff's copyright infringement if the defendant did not consider fair use. This is something that we've been hammering about in our, on our channel here for years. The plaintiff must consider fair use before sending a takedown notice and must do so in good faith, but only has to have a subjective belief. It does not have to be objective to everyone. It's subjective under their particular circumstances based on what they're going through at the time. This court previously held that Entec adequately pled its DMCA claim based on Entec's allegations that Ocularity automatically generates and submits DMCA notices without considering fair use. So this is a problem that we've seen on YouTube over and over and over again. People are really ticked off that DMCA notices get sent without considering fair use. So now we finally have a lawsuit that's going to help us understand what a court will do for automatic DMCA notices that don't consider fair use. The court reasoned that those allegations, if true, were enough to constitute a lack of subjective good faith belief, because if Ocularity failed to consider fair use, it could not have formed a good faith belief that the images were infringing. In the instant motion to dismiss, defendants contend that dismissal of the DMCA claim is appropriate for two related reasons. Defendants' arguments are as follows. In its third amended complaint, Entec alleges that the DMCA takedown notices are automatically generated, but Entec does not allege that the notices are automatically submitted as Entech alleged in its previous pleadings. Therefore, the third amended complaint does not support an inference that Ocularity's process does not include any infringement or fair use analysis. Two, by alleging that many or all of the DMCA notices contained identical verbatim discussion of infringement and fair use, Entech effectively admits that Ocularity did, in fact, conduct infringement and fair use analysis before submitting DMCA takedown notices. In this regard, each takedown notice contains a multi-paragraph legal analysis of fair use with respect to the allegedly infringing work. However, the fair use analysis contained in the takedown notices is identical for each of the allegedly infringing works. Entech's allegation that the DMCA notices contained an analysis of infringement and fair use presents a question of first impression with respect to the standard for pleading a claim under Section 512F. Is it sufficient for Entech to allege that, notwithstanding the takedown notices explicit and extensive fair use analysis, defendants did not actually or sufficiently consider fair use before issuing the takedown notices? At first blush, the fact that the DMCA takedown notices contain fair use analyses, even if those analyses are identical and pro forma, seems to satisfy the requirement to consider fair use before issuing a takedown notice under Lentz. The presence of the purported fair use analysis in each takedown notice also distinguishes this case from Lentz, where the plaintiff alleged that the defendant did not consider fair use at all. Is Entech required to allege additional facts in view of the appearance that defendants considered fair use? For example, must Entech allege evidentiary facts concerning defendants' analytical processes or subjective state of mind, the type of facts which in most cases are not available to plaintiff before discovery is taken? Does the Iqbal Twombly plausibility standard from those jurisdiction cases require Entech to aver its own analysis of fair use to support an inference? that defendants merely paid lip service to the consideration of fair use. In this regard, because Section 512F does not require an exacting consideration of fair use principles, defendants contend that Entech is required to plead a lack of subjective good faith belief supported by sufficient factual allegations plausibly to show the same. 
Defendants argue that 512F requires only so much consideration of fair use as to form a subjective good faith belief, and only the complete failure to consider fair use, and the knowledge that one failed to do so when submitting the DMCA takedown notice has previously been found to violate this standard. Having considered these questions, the court concludes that Entech's allegation in the third amended complaint are sufficient at this stage of the litigation. Although Lentz involved a motion for summary judgment, that decision is nevertheless instructive with respect to the issue presently before the court. Lentz supports the conclusion that the question of whether a copyright owner formed a subjective good faith belief that an alleged infringer's copying of the work did not constitute fair use is, in most circumstances, a factual issue that is not appropriate for resolution on a motion to dismiss. Because the DMCA requires consideration of fair use prior to sending takedown notifications, the Ninth Circuit held that a jury must determine whether the defendant's actions were sufficient to form a subjective good faith belief about the allegedly infringing video's fair use or lack thereof. The court makes no finding that would preclude a future motion for summary judgment by any party in this case. In Lentz, the Ninth Circuit explained that a copyright holder who pays lip service to the consideration of fair use by claiming it formed a good faith belief when there is evidence to the contrary is still subject to 512F liability. In this regard, the plaintiff in Lentz submitted evidence that the defendant did not form any subjective belief about the video's fair use, one way or another, because it failed to consider fair use at all, and knew that it failed to do so. The presence of such evidence, therefore, precluded summary judgment. This case, in contrast, is still in its initial stages. In response to the arguments in the dissenting opinion regarding the propriety of granting summary judgment, the Lentz panel majority explained that the relevant question was whether the analysis the defendant did conduct of the allegedly infringing material was sufficient not to conclusively establish as a matter of law that the use of the copyrighted material was fair, but to form a subjective good faith belief that the video was infringing on the copyright. Therefore, because it is generally a factual issue whether the analysis that the defendant did conduct of the alleged infringing material was sufficient, it necessarily follows that to plead a claim under Section 512F, it is enough for Entech to allege that defendants did not consider fair use sufficiently or at all before issuing the takedown notices. And that is exactly what Entech alleges here. Requiring Entech to allege more would effectively impose a heightened pleading standard, and no authority holds that claims under 512F must be pled with particularity, like fraud. Moreover, this court previously held that Entech's claim under 512F does not turn upon allegations of fraud, and therefore that Entech is not required to plead its DMCA claim with particularity. So in other words, the court is saying that the Federal Rule 9b requirement to plead fraud with particularity does not apply to Section 512F misrepresentations. So misrepresentations are not the same as fraud. Thus, although it may be advisable for a plaintiff like Entech to aver additional facts, such as its own analysis of fair use, to support the allegation that a defendant's fair use analysis was merely pro forma or in form, the court cannot conclude that Entech is required to plead such factors in order to state a plausible claim for relief under Section 512F. Based on the foregoing, the court finds that Entech sufficiently pled its DMCA claim. It denies defendant's motion to dismiss. On to the RICO claim. In its Third Amendment complaint, Entech alleges that defendants formed an enterprise that engages in a pattern of racketeering activity to harm Entech in violation of RICO. Uh, Brief reminder that our favorite Twitter lawyer, Pope Hat, former prosecutor, Ken White, has a whole blog, and one of his most often shared posts is, it's never Rico. It's not Rico, it's never Rico. Defendants argue that the Nor Pennington Doctrine, which is from the ERR President's Conference versus Noor Motor Freight and the United Mine Workers of America versus Pennington cases in 1965, that the Noor Pennington Doctrine bars Entech's RICO claim. Defendants also argue that Entech fails to plead its RICO claim with particularity. However, because the court finds that the Noor Pennington Doctrine bars the RICO claim and that the sham litigation exception to the doctrine does not apply, the court need not reach the second argument. 
In its opposition, Entech acknowledges this court's previous ruling that the DMCA takedown notices constitute petitioning activity for the purpose of the Nor Pennington Doctrine. Accordingly, Entech's argument is limited to whether the sham litigation exception to the Nor Pennington Doctrine applies in that case. Well, what is the exception? Under that exception, a party cannot claim the protections of the Nor Pennington Doctrine if it engaged in sham litigation. Since the judge does not appear to be explaining the Nor Pennington Doctrine, let's examine the Nor Pennington Doctrine real quick, since I'm not familiar with it. Under the Nor Pennington Doctrine, private entities are immune from liability under antitrust law for attempts to influence the passage or enforcement of laws, even if the laws they advocate for would have anti-competitive effects. The doctrine is grounded in the First Amendment protection of political speech and upon a recognition that the antitrust laws, tailored as they are for the business world, are not at all appropriate for application to the political arena. So if a company petitions Congress to make a law and that law has anti-competitive effects, you can't sue that company. If Epic Games petitions Congress to make a law that says Apple and Google have to allow the Epic Games app store onto Apple and Google, Apple or Google couldn't then sue. Apple or Google couldn't then sue. Here's a matching Google result. Apple and Google couldn't then sue for some kind of anti-competitive or antitrust violation. To assert the sham litigation exception, Entech must allege that defendants' transmittal of DMCA notices, the petitioning conduct, was both objectively baseless and subjectively improper. In this regard, the Ninth Circuit has held that nor Pennington immunity is not a shield for petitioning conduct that, although ostensibly directed toward influencing governmental action, is a mere sham to cover what is actually nothing more than an attempt to interfere directly with the business relationships of a competitor. Entech contends that the defendant's transmittal of the DMCA takedown notices was objectively baseless because defendants did not have exclusive ownership of some of the allegedly infringing photographs, and therefore, defendant ocularity through defendant Nicolini did not have a good faith basis for believing that it was acting on behalf of the owner of an exclusive right. And two, no reasonable litigant in similar circumstances would have claimed damages in the amount claimed by defendants in connection with the alleged infringement. The court is not persuaded. Entech's argument that defendants did not have exclusive rights in the allegedly infringing material is not supported by sufficient allegation, such as facts to show that defendants assigned their rights or granted an exclusive license. Moreover, defendants pled in their counterclaim that they own the copyright rights for all the photos at issue. The court is also not persuaded that the broad exposure of the photos on the internet supports an inference that any defendant has relinquished its exclusive rights in any of the photos. The allegation that the photos were widely distributed, credited as true, does not necessarily mean that defendants relinquished their exclusive ownership of the works, and there are insufficient facts alleged to support any inference to the contrary. Uh, this brings up a difference between trademark and copyright. If there's widespread infringement of your trademark and you don't do anything about it, your trademark could suffer. But copyright does not have such a requirement. If a million people are illegally sharing your copyrighted work and you don't pursue them, but you pursue one person over here, they can argue till the cows come home that you went after them illegally, inappropriately. But they can it's only an argument and it doesn't really have any weight because the copyright owner is allowed to pick and choose who they allow to infringe their copyrights or not, and they don't lose their copyrights. Accordingly, the court concludes that Antec has not demonstrated that defendant's transmittal of DMCA takedown notices was objectively baseless. Because the court finds that they failed to demonstrate objective baselessness, the court need not address the subjective improper element. In sum, Entech's RICO claim is barred by the Nor Pennington Doctrine. The court grants defendant's motion to dismiss. On the motion for sanctions and order to show cause, the rules of civil procedure authorize a district court to impose sanctions against any attorney, law firm, or party who signs a pleading that is not well grounded in fact. Rule 11 imposes an affirmative duty upon counsel to investigate the law and the facts before filing. This duty requires a reasonable inquiry. The subjective intent of the filing attorney is irrelevant. The standard is objective reasonableness, viewed from the perspective of a competent attorney admitted to practice before the court. 
In cases where the complaint is the primary focus of Rule 11 proceedings, a district court must conduct a two-prong inquiry to determine, one, whether the complaint is legally or factually baseless from an objective perspective, and two, if the attorney has conducted a reasonable and competent inquiry before signing and filing it. As a rule, Rule 11 should not be used to raise issues as to the legal sufficiency of a claim or defense that more appropriately can be disposed of by a motion to dismiss, motion for judgment on the pleadings, motion for summary judgment, or a trial on the merits. The fundamental question before the court is whether the challenged allegations are objectively baseless. That question turns upon whether Mr. Towler and his law firm conducted a reasonable inquiry. In their motion for sanctions, defendants contend that Mr. Towler and his law firm failed to make a reasonable inquiry and ignored evidence and information provided by defendants regarding Entech's DMCA claim and RICO claim. The thrust of defendants' argument relates to pre-litigation communications between Mr. Towler and defendants and their counsel. In the course of these communications, defendants advised Mr. Towler that Mr. Nicolini conducted an analysis of fair use with respect to each alleged infringement before transmitting the respective DMCA takedown notices and that the notices were not automatically submitted without human intervention. To support those assertions, defendants provided Mr. Towler with a spreadsheet purporting to show that Mr. Nicolini reviewed each alleged infringement before transmitting the takedown notices and screenshots of the allegedly infringing photos. Defendants therefore contend that Entech's allegations contradicting this information run afoul of Rule 11. The court's analysis with respect to the Lentz decision, which is discussed in the preceding section, is dispositive of whether sanctions are warranted. Because the court finds that it is generally a factual issue whether the defendant's analysis of the alleged infringing material was sufficient, the court cannot conclude that the challenged allegations are objectively baseless under Rule 11. The parties have strong disagreements with respect to the inquiry that is required under these circumstances. However, defendants' arguments effectively ask this court to rule on the merits of Entech's DMCA claim, which is not appropriate in the context of a motion under Rule 11 at this stage of litigation. Similarly, notwithstanding the court's decision to dismiss the RICO claim with prejudice in view of the broad standards set forth in Lentz, the nature of defendants' process for generating takedown notices and the parties' differing views with respect to the disputed facts in this case, the court concludes that it was not objectively unreasonable for Entech to pursue a RICO theory of liability. Accordingly, the sanctions motion is denied and the order to show cause discharged, and that's the end of that. So the DMCA 512F claim does go forward, and Entech will get a chance on some level, through, probably through discovery, because that's the next stage of the case. Unless this is settled, they'll go to discovery, and then the parties will have to exchange relevant evidence as requested by the opposing party, and they can't withhold evidence. They could get in big trouble for withholding evidence, so nobody withhold any evidence. And either the plaintiff can show that the DMCA notices were sent without consideration of fair use under the standard, or the plaintiff can't show that. And then one of the parties will win and hopefully will get some sort of reasoned decision that will then hopefully guide us a little bit as to what happens when a DMCA notice is sent under those circumstances. It will depend heavily on what the actual circumstances were. So this case is not necessarily a silver bullet or panacea for every automatic DMCA notice sent on YouTube, but it's uh, it's a hope we can we can hope and dream that someday we will get some sort of precedential ruling or at least persuasive or guiding ruling on what happens when dmca notices are sent automatically with or without consideration of fair use has yet to be seen let me know your thoughts in the comments below what do you think of automatic dmca notices that get people's channels taken down and those people have to appeal to youtube and they have to rely on youtube who sometimes makes questionable decisions on counter notices instead of just letting them be a dry counter notice thing where the claiming party sends a takedown notice and then the the second owner sends a counter notice and then YouTube just obeys it. YouTube now sort of gets involved. I don't like that. Do you like that? I don't like that. Let me know what you think in the comments below. 
Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel here on YouTube. You can also find us on Floatplane and on twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsors.com slash law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of March. Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Bernard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Rudolph Becherer Jr., Brandon Abel, Torpedon, Cassandra Curran, Sovereign Titison, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, and Earthbound Star. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all.